Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's RTA webinar. My name is Lynn Smith, and today I'm also joined by my colleague, Sam Gaylor. We are both in the Legislation Implementation Project team at the RTA, and our role today is to provide you with an overview of the upcoming rental law changes that's starting on the 30th of September, and what this means for you and the rental sector. So welcome, Sam, and thanks for joining me today. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are hosting today's webinar and where you are joining us as well and pay our respects to elders past and present, past, present and emerging. A special shout out to our regional and rural attendees as well today who are joining us. Now today's webinar is focusing on the proclamation topics and we do have a lot to get through to get through in today's webinar. Our aim is here is to help you understand what the next round of changes are starting on the 30th of September. We are also going to touch on what's due to start on the 1st of May in 2025 as well. Today, we're not focusing on the changes that commenced on the 6th of June, but on the changes that are about to start. If you do have any questions, you can submit them through the chat function, which is a little um, speech bubble on your Zoom toolbar. However, please note, depending on the time, we may not get to all of your, your, all of your questions, um, noting that the response for registrations today has been um, quite significant and we do have a lot of people attending. We know asking your questions that someone else may have the same thought. So this does actually help us create future content on our website, uh, not just to help yourself, but also everyone in the sector. At the end of today's webinar, we do also have a quick survey to complete and you have that opportunity to also let us know what other topics you would like to know more about. So before we start, the role of the RTA is to administer Queensland's tenancy laws. And we do this through many services. The RTA has our contact centre where we can provide information in relation to bond and tenancy matters. Uh, we have our bond management, our free dispute resolution and our compliance and enforcement. Now, I do need to point out that we do not write the tenancy laws. Our role is to help you and everyone in the rental sector understand the laws and the rights and responsibilities under these laws. Now, while I appreciate some people may feel a little bit frustrated with the law changes, our role today is here to provide you with education. There are other avenues for you to provide feedback on the changes, and that's either directly to Department of Housing or talking with your local member. So just a reminder that the rental reform journey did start back in 2018-19 with a consultation and then introduced in the introduction of stage one in 2021. And that was implemented from 21 to 24 with the last section being minimum housing standards for all tenancies. And that commenced um, earlier this month on the 1st of September, 2024. Now this year we saw a bill introduced into Parliament and the Residential Tenancies and Roomy Accommodation and Other Legislation Amendment Act 2024 was passed in May with some changes starting on assent, which was the 6th of June, and the other changes starting on proclamation. Now the proclamation dates were recently announced and this means that some of the changes will start on the 3rd of September for part one and other changes on the 1st of May, 2025 for part two. So if you are looking for information on the 6th of June changes, then please do have a look on our website for those changes. So to help understand the upcoming changes, I've grouped them into three main areas. Today, our focus is those changes on the 3rd of September, because they are just around the corner. And I will, however, touch on the 1st of May topics as well. But we will be doing more education in the lead up to the May 2025 changes. Remember the changes will impact general tenancies, roomy accommodation and movable dwelling tenancies. So the next set of slides that I'm going to be presenting on will be focusing on what commences 30th of September 2024 only. So let's start with rent payments. Now, a tenant must be offered at least two ways to pay rent 
including a way that does not compel the tenant to incur more than usual bank transfer costs and is reasonably available to the tenant. So it's not totally a fee-free way. The legislation outlines where it is not more than the bank fee or an account fee usually payable in a transaction. So this may be such as like a direct bank transfer. Now the existing tenancy agreements can continue with the payment method as listed in the agreement. However, if you are looking to change the method during the tenancy, then both parties need to agree or a manager or owner can offer the new options. So in other words, any new or renewal agreements or changes during a tenancy for payment methods must comply with the offer of two ways um, and also ensure to disclose any associated costs by providing written notice to the tenant or the resident of what those costs might be. Now, with regards to the service or utility bills, so this is probably such as like your water bills, the manager or owner will need to provide the bill to the tenant within four weeks after the owner receives the document. Now, if the tenant does not receive the documents within the required time frame, they do not have to pay. Now, we know that this is followed on from when tenants suddenly receive three or four bills in one go, and we also know QCAT adjudicators, when making decisions, have not looked favourably at multiple bills being saved up and given to the tenant in one go. So this change will now put a time frame around passing on the bills in a timely manner and assist the tenants to budget. The time frame for the tenant to pay a water bill is still one month. We also understand that some bills, and again, particularly like your water bills, don't always align with the start and end of a tenancy. The changes do allow for a partial billing period and the amount owed is calculated based on reasonable estimate of consumption and ensuring that the entry and exit condition report notes what those readings are. Now, Sam, I'm going to invite you um, back in. What we're going to do is just have a look at some of the questions that we've recently received at some of our information sessions. Um, and this might actually help with some of the questions that we've also been receiving through as well. So the first question, Sam, is what are the reasonable costs for payments? So this is your rent payments. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Lynn. Uh, thanks for a, a nice, easy question as well. Um, reasonable, uh, we can't specify what is and what isn't reasonable. It's not defined in the Act. Um, obviously, there's the ability to communicate with each other, but we're, we're more looking at like your, your standard kind of merchant, uh, merchant fees rather than any um, you know, significant penalty amounts or anything like that. Right. Um, now, can real estate agents still use third party platforms for rent payments? Now, we know that some of these third, part, third party platforms you like use like higher fees or potentially a percentage of that transaction for when the tenant does pay rent. So that could be seen to be beyond the normal bank fee for a couple, which might be just a couple of dollars. Uh, yeah, potentially. And um, estate agents can still use those third party platforms, but this is about making sure that um, they're also providing an option that is reasonably accessible and has those reasonable costs. Now, do I have to change over my existing tenants agreement to new methods of paying rent? No, there is that uh, transition period uh, that you mentioned, Lynn. Um, it would be where the uh, tenancy agreement starts after 30 September or is renewed uh, or if a change is being made, um, then there is that requirement to, uh, to make sure you're providing the uh, approved um, ways. Okay, so we're going to go talk about the service charges. Can I still issue an invoice mm -hmm. for water portion on a sub meter in a complex? I don't think anything's mm -hmm. really changed yeah. in that regard, has it? No, it hasn't. Uh, the The Act does talk about um, providing that sort of evidence of the cost from the supplier. So it might just be that um, as well as providing the, the portion 
um, that relates to the individual submeter uh, that you also give um, the, I guess, the total for the complex potentially and obviously uh, de-identifying and blacking out anything that's not necessary, but it's part of that providing evidence of the costs. Which probably aligns a little bit with the next question that water bills don't align with the start and end of tenancy dates. And we, we know that. Mm -hmm. And can you do the meter reading and how do I calculate this without the water bill from the authority, which probably goes a little yep. bit with what the submeter process is too. Yeah, so and it's it's very similar to how it's uh, how it's been standard practice um, already. Yeah, making sure you're noting uh, the meter reading at the start and putting it on the entry condition report. Um, and then to work out the, the water bill, again, this isn't to do with the changes necessarily, but it's uh, having a look at things like the um, state bulk water charge uh, on a previous bill and being able to then calculate and provide that evidence to the tenant. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Um, if you do have any other questions about um, the rent or the service charges, please pop them in the um, chat function for us. So I'll just keep going. Now, the next topic is around ending a tenancy early or also known in the sector as a lease break. This is where a tenant may look to give a notice to end the tenancy early and leave prior to the end date of that fixed term agreement. Now, the word reasonable costs is being replaced with reletting cost and outlines the maximum costs that can be charged. It is based on the remaining time on the agreement and whether or not the fixed term is less or greater than three years. Now I'm going to show you a table shortly of what this will actually look like. Now, the changes do allow for a transitional period to apply for existing agreements before 30 September 2024 and state that providing the agreement includes a term about paying relating costs it can continue for that agreement. So this means any existing agreements before 30 of September, 2024, it would be the normal practice. So as an example, if you're asking for the reimbursement of a reletting fee, compensation of loss of rent, et cetera, and not being calculated at the new way. So that can still occur in as part of that transitional period. However, for new or renewal agreements, from the 30th of September 2024, it will be need to be done on the calculated on the new cost and whether it's a percentage of the remaining term or the rent that's going to be between tenancies. So what does that all mean? So on this slide, it's a bit of a, shows you the calculation. So again, it's based on that remaining time on the agreement. The relating cost absorbs all those previous reasonable costs. That is, there's no reimbursement of advertising costs or the relating cost of a week's rent plus GST that most managers may seek to reimburse for a landlord. Um, there's no separate claim for compensation for loss of rent. It is going to be calculated based on the remaining term or whether it is the rent payable between the tenant vacating and a new tenant moving in. So in other words, we're looking at it's the compensation of loss of rent between tenancies or it's the calculated relating cost as per the table. Now, we do understand that most people would have a fixed lease term that's probably under three years. So let's focus in that middle column. It is an amount equal to rent payable for the period between the tenant vacating and, and the date of the new agreement starting or if it is less than 25% of the fixed term has expired, it's an amount equal to four weeks rent. Then it works its way through. If it's less than 50%, but more than 25%, then it's three weeks. Less than 75%, but more than 50%, equal to two weeks. And then if it's seven, if it's um, less than 75, if sorry, then if it's less than 75 if it's more than 75 percent has expired an amount equal to one week's rent so if you do have a lease that's greater than three years as a fixed term then it would equate to one month for each 12 month period remaining or an amount equal to the rent payable between the tenant vacating and the new date of the agreement so to help customers, uh, the RTA is producing an online calculator to assist in working out 
what is the amount of weeks and helping to work out the percentage of the term. Now the calculator is not going to do a dollar amount or to make the decision, but to help calculate the remaining term. So the calculator will be available on the RTA's website from the 3rd of September. So remember, it's the lesser amount. So for when the agreement is ended early by the tenant, it is the amount of rent payable or the rent compensation until a new tenancy starts or it's the calculated reletting cost. Now, I know this is a significant change in the sector. So just to understand the new way, in a nutshell, the reletting cost absorbs the previous charges that might have been a week's rent plus GST in reimbursing the landlord for their costs that an agent may have charged. Agents may have charged advertising costs or um, and all the loss of rent until a new tenant is found. That is all absorbed into one. And it is now the rent period between the tenant vacating to a new tenant starting or it will be calculated based on the percentage of the fixed term expired. So as an example, if, and we would encourage any tenant that is potentially having to look at ending their agreement early to give as much notice as possible to their property manager or to their owner to try and help mitigate the loss of the claim of the what might actually occur. So the mitigation is still there. So as much notice as possible. Now, if hypothetically, it takes two weeks to find a replacement tenant, um, that would be the compensation of claim or rent. But if 75% of the term of the agreement has expired, then the maximum term would be one week's rent. So the lesser of those two amounts is actually the one week's rent. So, so the equivalent to the one week. So that would mean that the compensation would not be the two weeks because that is the greater amount. It would fall to the one week because 75% or more of the agreement had expired. Now I'm just gonna go to some of the questions, Sam. So I'll invite you to come back on. So what happens if the actual cost exceeds four weeks to relet, knowing that that is the actual maximum, again, would only be if only 25% of the agreement had expired? Yeah, so um, if the, the actual cost relating to the relet exceeds the four weeks, the amount that can be um, claimed on that is actually just that four weeks. So it is capped on that amount. Um, oops, sorry. Can a tenant be charged other costs when they break a lease and leave early? And this might actually help answer a few questions that's also coming through. And, and we know that um, you know, reletting and break leases uh, are often um, topics of, uh, of extreme interest in the sector. So this talks only about the reletting costs. Um, if there are other costs that don't relate specifically to the ending of the tenancy early, we're talking about damage, we're talking about cleaning, um, those kinds of things, then they can still be charged. This is just talking about reletting costs. Current tenancy agreement has a term regarding related costs to be paid by the tenant. Is it still valid? Yeah. So uh, where the agreement was signed prior to 30th of September, again, we've got a transitional period in there um, where the laws as they stand today uh, would continue on. So that would be the um, compensation for loss of rent, those kinds of things. Um, it would only be where a tenancy agreement is signed after the 30th uh, or renewed after that time, um, that these new laws would then come in. Right. So that might actually answer a couple of questions there that keep in mind, if you've got that valid term in the agreement, then obviously it continues through because the agreement is before the 3rd September. So new and renewed agreements post 3rd September will fall to this new way. So can I still charge out-of-pocket expenses of advertising due to the tenant leaving early? Uh, it's just all captured in the reletting costs. So um, the four weeks in the event that it's only 25% of the um, tenancy has been uh, expired, it would all be captured in the uh, in the reletting costs. So you can't go above um, that uh, that maximum amount. 
And if I don't know whether the amount is less or more than the rent gap or the calculation, can I still claim on the rental bond? Yeah, so I mean, we shouldn't be claiming on the bond when we don't know the amount, but ultimately it's it would be something that would progress through to a dispute on the bond, most likely. So we'd encourage that communication between the parties, doing everything that you can to get a new tenant into the property um, and making sure that that, uh, that gap where the property is vacant is as small as possible. Um, and then it's a negotiation through dispute resolution um, on the bond. And just on that as well, um, part of the uh, addition to the legislation is that QCAT can't actually make a ruling on uh, relating costs that goes above what's in the legislation. And just quickly too, Sam, with the legislation changes, it does mention too that obviously um, if QCAT, if a matter does go to QCAT, they do actually have to look at what the legislation says in relation to what the maximum might be in relation to these relating costs. Yeah, correct. Okay, we're just going to move on. I know that there's quite a few um, questions and some statements in relation to the relating costs and we appreciate your feedback. Um, we'll just move on to the maximum rental bond. So from the 3rd of September, the maximum bond amount for general tenancies and roomy accommodation will be four times the weekly rent amount, no matter what the weekly rent amount is. So we know currently if the rent is over $700 per week for general tenancies and $500 for rooming, the bond can be negotiable and to be more than that four times the weekly rent amount. However, from the 3rd September 2024, it will be a maximum of four weeks, no matter what the rent amount is. Now, the maximum bond for movable dwellings will still remain the same as it currently is, which is two times the weekly rent or three times if electricity charges are passed on to the tenant and the, pro and the um, property is individually metered. So for agreements renewed after the 30th of September, where the bond exceeds that maximum amount, the contributors of the bond, so that's the tenants who have paid the bond, can request a refund of the excess amount and there is going to be a new form. It's going to be a bond refund for excess bond amount. It's a form B, uh, sorry, a form 4B. Now, this process does not start the normal RTA notice of claim process where a manager or an owner is advised of that claim. So we will obviously need to inform the owner um, or the manager that there has been um, a refund done of the excess amount, but it's not that notice of claim process. So I just want to reiterate here that the tenant or the bond contributors ability to claim the excess amount from the RTA is only when there is a renewal agreement entered into. So for existing agreements where there's not a renewal entered into, the amount will remain as is and continues through till the end of that tenancy, then the tenant or the property manager or owner will follow the normal bond refund process. Now we'll say too, if you are a managing party, so if you are a manager or an owner and you would like to be proactive in this process, then you may like to consider releasing any excess bond amount during the tenancy through the normal refund process. So releasing part of that bond, that excess amount through the form four process. This will also provide you with a uh, greater control over what does happen. Alternatively, as I mentioned, the new form 4B will only be available for bond contributors to complete. So again, just reiterating here that there is a process and again, the excess bond amount would only be going out um, when a tenant actually applies for it or bond contributor applies for it. And also to ensuring that uh, there is a renewal agreement that's been entered into. Now, if there's a bond claim or a bond dispute lodged by, with the RTA by the property manager or owner, they will need to provide evidence of their claim to the tenant within 14 days. Now, again, there is a transitional period for this, which is depending on when the bond was originally lodged with the RTA. And I'm going to talk about that shortly. 
Now, evidence to the tenant may include receipts, repair quotes or records of unpaid rent. And while the Act does not define what the evidence is and does provide these examples, you can see the examples are based around demonstrating a monetary amount. Now, the penalty provision in this section applies to the action of providing the evidence in the 14-day timeframe, not what the evidence is. So please note that that 14-day timeframe is very different and not the RTA Notice of Claim timeframe. They are two separate processes and most likely the two processes may actually cross over. The Notice of Claim is where someone like a manager or an owner or a tenant has put a claim on the bond to the RTA without the other party's signature or agreement. The RTA then writes out to the other party and say, do you agree or disagree? So in that process, again, you could have this other process running at the same time where you are a manager or an owner is looking to actually provide that evidence in that 14 day time frame. Now we know, I'll just talk about the transitional period for this. So we know that the quickest way to get a bond refund is an agreed refund between a manager and owner and a tenant. And we encourage that good communication not during just during the tenancy, but also importantly at the end of the tenancy, where we know if there's an issue, sometimes just talking with each other can help resolve the matter. Showing um, photos and ensuring the exit and entry condition reports are completed and also compared to each other. So let's step through the transitional period for providing evidence on a bond claim or a bond dispute. So if there is a bond claim or dispute before the 3rd of September, it is not a legislation requirement to provide the evidence within 14 days. As I mentioned earlier, we would recommend, obviously, managers and owners and tenants sharing some information and discussing how the bond is going to be paid out. Now, if the bond was lodged at the RTA prior to the 30th of September and there's a claim on the bond from 30th of September 2024, the transitional period applies and that means that the property manager or owner does not need to start supplying the evidence until the 30th of September 2025. On the last column that you will see on your slides there, if a bond is lodged at the RTA after 30th of September 2024 and there is also a claim on the bond or a dispute from the 30th of September 2024, then the provision to provide the evidence to the tenant within the 14 days of the bond claim or dispute lodged will apply. As I mentioned earlier, the penalties in this provision relate to the property manager or the owner providing that evidence to the tenant within that prescribed time frame. Now, Sam, I'm going to get you to come on. Um, and what happens, can a property manager dispute a claim on the excess bond amount? Uh, so unlike uh, the current bond processes that we have legislated, this part actually doesn't have a provision for a property manager or an owner to dispute a claim uh, on that excess bond amount. Um, now, we've had a few questions coming through. I totally understand that, uh, that people are finding that a little bit um, a little bit, I guess, different to what we'd normally have. Um, one of the questions that came through was around, well, you know, with the, the tenant advising the weekly rent amount, if that wasn't actually the case and potentially they, they've claimed money. Um, while there's not a dispute process, uh, the RTA will send out advice after the process has been completed that advises of what the bond amount is uh, being held to all parties. If that was uh, incorrect. Um, ultimately, uh, we process forms based on the information provided to us, um, but that would put the tenant in breach uh, in their agreement. And yeah, if the bond being held is then below the maximum as per the uh, standard term in the tenancy agreement, that tenant would then be in breach and you can follow the breach process for that. Excellent. Um, now, if the lease is not renewed, does the excess bond remain at the RTA? Well, that's a quick answer, yes. isn't it? Yes, yeah. it does. Um, and it's not required to be um, claimed. You know, if people want to keep that excess, if they want to keep that amount in the bond, um, then they absolutely can. There's no issue with that. And I know that there was a question there that obviously part of this trigger for renewing, uh, for getting the excess is a renewal. So if a renewal doesn't yep. happen and the tenant continues through 
on that agreement or um, on a periodic, then it just continues. Is that correct? Correct. What happens if not all tenants sign the excess bond refund form? So if you've got multiple yeah. tenants, they've got the excess amount. Yeah, um, so it's some very uh, strict processes uh, around this. Uh, it's very sort of small um, cohort who can actually use this process. Uh, if not all of the tenants sign or it's not matching up with RTA records, the form will be rejected um, and they'll need to submit a, a new form. So it's got to match everything that we've got on record. Now, does a bond top up, so due to a rent increase after the 3rd of September, does that impact the original bond date, lodgement date? No, so, so when yeah. we're talking about the bond uh, being lodged as a, as a um, trigger for this, uh, it's about the original bond. Uh, it's not about any sort of subsequent top up. And what if I cannot get a quote or repair done within the 14 day time frame for evidence? And this probably answers quite a few questions that we've actually got coming through. Yeah. Um, and look, uh, I guess we uh, we understand this uh, in Queensland, particularly this is a very tough um, time frame to try and get things done with tradespeople. Ultimately, it's about providing the evidence that you have, um, that there's going to be a cost and that you uh, have an understanding of what that cost is going to be and providing that evidence to the tenant. Um, so it's about the, I guess, the dollar amount. Uh, it may be that it's not, um, you know, 100% completed by that point, uh, but it's uh, it's about making sure it's done as quickly as possible and being able to go through potentially the dispute process. So potentially, which is what a few people are asking, it could be like an estimate. Like if a tradesperson says, look, we would imagine this would actually cost this, but I can't quite get there in time, but we imagine mm. the, the estimate would be around this or this. So that would possibly yeah. be you know, helping along. You can, you can only, yeah, you can only provide what you can provide as, as with uh, previous um, webinars that we've done around tradespeople, for instance, uh, it's doing everything that you can to get the work carried out or quoted as quickly as possible. Um, you know, if you have a business practice, for instance, of only using a certain repair person, but that person's got delays, I'd be encouraging you to see if there's anyone else in the area who can at least give you um, a bit more insight into what the cost can be so that you can inform the tenant. Last one on this one, Sam, what if I cannot contact the tenant or resident with the evidence? Yeah, so the, the legislation talks about um, making reasonable attempts to contact the, the tenant or the resident, um, but that shouldn't be viewed as a, I don't have to provide them the evidence if I can't get in contact with them. So I've tried to contact them, uh, they're not picking up the phone or the email's bouncing back, so I'm not going to do anything, that's not what it's about. You still need to um, make all attempts to provide the evidence to the tenant. Um, so I'd be you know, sending an email, you've got uh, evidence that you have sent that email with the, the details in. Um, so don't just, I guess, think that you've got a bit more time because they're not picking up the phone. It's all about providing the evidence to them. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. Well, we'll just keep quickly going through because I am conscious we need to get through quite a few questions that still have come through. So the other changes include the ability for the RTA to share information with other government departments. And this will also include the Office of Fair Trading. Now, the Office of Fair Trading administers the Agents Financial Administration and Property Occupation Acts. So this impacts like real estate agents, property managers or on-site managers. So the licensed managers who are covered under these acts. So as we know, Office of Fair Trading have greater penalty units with some penalties ranging between 200 to 1,000 compared to say the RTA where we might sort of like be more around like the 20 or 40 penalty units. We also know that um, there are penalty provisions for providing false and misleading documents and more so if there is an investigation. However, this particular section has now actually been extended to include providing false and misleading information to the authority, which will encompass any documents or any forms submitted to the RTA. So we know that the changes that um, start on the 6th of June um, some of the, and also some of the upcoming changes will also have some new penalty units. So when we talk about penalty units, this is where the legislation will state a maximum penalty unit if someone breaches that particular section of the Act. It's not a breach of the tenancy agreement or a breach of a rooming agreement. That is a tenancy breach or a dispute or a QCAP matter. So it's a civil matter. 
Um, a non-compliant of legislation, it more fits into the criminal matter where our enforcement team can take further action, which may involve um, a non-compliance um, notification or issuing a penalty infringement notice, which is like a speeding fine, or potentially um, looking at a prosecution at the magistrate's court. So just to explain what we mean when we talk about that. Now, one of the questions um, that was asked before was about the excess bond and the amounts and so forth. So again, it's going to be very clear on our forms that providing false and misleading information, particularly on our forms, um, does come with penalty provisions. So I'm just going to have a quick look now at what's coming into play for 1 May 2025. So there will be a new standardised tenancy application form to use for prospective tenants and they must be offered an option to submit an application other than an online platform. Now, the type of information that can be obtained from a prospective tenant is prescribed. So in other words, the legislation will state what can or cannot be requested as part of that application process. It will also include what documents can be obtained or shown as part of the identification um, part of the prospective tenant as well. And at this stage, we have not seen what this form will look like. So when we know more, we will be sharing that with everyone. Again, just letting you know, what the changes are that's going to be happening for next year. Also too, if a property manager or owner um, uh, needs to disclose any associated costs um, and financial benefit that they may receive from any payment options. So that will start from May. Now the legislation outlines the timeframes and grounds for entry. So from the 1st of May 2025, the timeframes that are currently 24 hours in the legislation will be increased up to 48 hours. Um, and that will include things such as an inspection to show a prospective purchaser or a prospective tenant. Um, it could be maintenance and repairs. Now, keep in mind, routine inspections for general tenancies remain the same. That's that seven day time frame. Uh, and also too, for anyone for rooming accommodation, the 24 hours for cleaning um, will also remain the same. So this does not stop a tenant and an owner or manager having mutually agreement for entry under this time frame, or also to if there is an emergency. So again, this does not start now, this starts in 2025. Now also too, entry cannot occur more than twice in a seven day period after a notice has been given to end the tenancy. So this is either a notice to leave um, issued by a, a manager or an owner, or a notice of intention to leave from a tenant. Now, this purpose of this is to balance the access when a tenant is looking to pack up and leave the premises. Now, I do just want to flag, as we know, some managing parties, some agencies may have a practice of issuing a notice to leave to a tenant at the commencement of a new or a renewal agreement. Um, now, that may actually have some impacts moving forward in relation to the number of times that the entry during the tenancy um, is going to happen. So it's going to actually impact the whole of the tenancy because the no part of this section is about when that notice to leave is issued. So this is something that if you happen to have that as a practice, that you may need to look at whether there is an impact moving forward or also too, if an owner decides to look at selling during that term of the tenancy. Now, currently in the Act, if a tenant wishes to add fixtures or fittings or make any structural changes, they need the owner's approval. So this remains the same. However, the requirements to have, have been expanded to have the request on an approved form and for owners and managers to respond to the request within 28 days. So in a nutshell, this is adding a time frame for the owners or the managers to either agree or refuse or have an agreement that may be subject to conditions and formalising the request process. So noting that approval may also need to be sought from a body corporate and the legislation changes do provide for this, particularly with regards to like external appearance of a lot and bylaw requirements. So the body corporate, when we talk about that, that relates to the units or your townhouses and apartments in a strata title complex. 
So again, this is up to the owner or the manager, and again, applicable if applicable, the body corporate, whether they agree or not. And what the new section does put in is it's a process in place for both the tenant and the manager or the owner, and that there's going to be a new request form. Um, and again, just tightening up the time frame around responding to that request. Noting too that a tenant can also apply to QCAT for a ruling about fixtures or making any structural changes as well. So we are all in a world now where we need to be mindful of our own personal information and how and where that is shared or stored. So there are new provisions regarding protection of personal information. Any documents that might be received from a prospective tenant must be securely destroyed within three months. And for tenants or residents in an agreement when the end of the tenancy is coming, they must be that must be destroyed within seven years at the end of the tenancy. So this is ensuring that personal information from a prospective tenant or the tenant and resident is securely destroyed when no longer required and addressing that protection of people's personal information and identification. Now, definition in the changes um, have been made as well, meaning as in the Privacy Act, so the Commonwealth Privacy Act, which will also now include photos or images of personal possessions or standard of living. So this could relate to any routine inspections. If you happen to have taken a photo or two that may have either had the tenant's possessions or how someone is living in the rental property. So that's the main changes that's going to be happening as of 1 May. Now, I realise it's a lot to take in and we do have a lot of questions still coming through. But before I finish off on the main changes, we know that on assent in June, the legislation allowed for three heads of power. This means it allowed for creation of a regulation relating to the portable bond scheme, a rental code of conduct and a framework for modifications for safety, security and accessibility. Now, these have yet to be created. So once we know more and when there is a start date on these, we will be able to share that with you and the sector. What this looks like, we don't know just yet, and we will keep you informed. Noting too that the regulation does need to be created and started within two years of assent. So that's two years from the 6th of June. So that's by the 6th of June, 2026. Otherwise they do lapse. So this means that other than the 3rd of September 2024 changes and the 1 May 25 changes in the current legislation, this is the only other part that has yet to have a start date announced. Now, I know that, um, Sam, you put some links in the um, chat along the way in relation to going directly to a specific page on our website about the tenancy law changes. On our slide that we have up there now is a QR code. If you happen to have your phone handy, if you scan that QR code, it will also take you to the specific law changes pages on our website where we have fact sheets, videos, podcasts um, and other information that will actually help you step through some more information about these changes. We also have a page of frequently asked questions and that is um, we've listed it under each of the headings so that most likely you will find a lot of answers to your questions there as well. So just in summary, before we get to your questions, the new laws for proclamation are being introduced into two parts. So proclamation part one, starting on the 3rd of September 2024, and the other part, proclamation part two, in May of next year. We are here to help you navigate these rental law changes, and we hope you'll use our website and those FAQs. Um, importantly too, our main message is to know your rights and obligations and also that good communication is key to a successful tenancy. We're here to help you and we're also going through these legislation changes with you. So remember too that there will be some new forms released and also too, as these changes come in, our forms will be updated. And it's really important to make sure that you do use those latest forms. Okay, Sam, we are nearly going to be out of time, but hopefully you've been able to actually go through all those questions that have been rolling through on the slides. Um, and also just um, see if you can actually maybe group some of the themes together and maybe be able to answer some of those questions. So over to you, Sam. Um, just, no worries. So just really quickly, um, yeah, just to clarify, I'm not asleep uh, when I'm off screen. I'm just uh, reading through the questions. So 
Thank you to everyone who's uh, who sent the details through. I'm not going to get into too much into the um, changes coming for uh, stage two of the proclamation in May, but there have been some questions around the entry restrictions. Um, I will just answer the bulk of them by saying that you can always um, reach agreement. So if the tenant wants to agree to extra um, entries uh, outside of the legislation, that is fine. Um, a lot of the questions that we've had come through talk about the, the break lease um, scenario and the re-letting costs. So yeah, just to, to clarify, um, in the event that a tenancy agreement was ended early by the tenant and it's 25% or less of that agreement has been completed, it would be capped at four weeks uh, worth of rent. And that would be to cover all of the costs associated with reletting. So that's your advertising, that's your um, reletting fee, all of those. Uh, if in that scenario, the property was relet within uh, five days, for argument's sake, then five days would, worth of rent would be the amount that you would be um, able to recover uh, because it is the lower amount. So it's giving certainty to um, people when they're ending a tenancy that they know what their costs are going to be. Um, we understand that that is a, a significant change um, to the sector and that'll take a bit of time getting used to, but we will be there to assist uh, with any questions. As you mentioned, Lynn, the, the FAQs, I put a link to them a couple of times uh, in the chat. Um, a lot of the questions that we've been getting uh, are covered there. Uh, with regards to uh, water bills, um, yeah, just a, a reminder that as at this point, it's the, the same as it's been for uh, the last few years. Um, no changes at this point. We're talking about changes that come in on the 30th of September. The majority of, uh, of people will be providing these bills um, as soon as they get them anyway. This will just be encouraging that so that we're not seeing uh, water bills uh, as an example, stockpiled and then given to a tenant at the end of a tenancy. Um, sometimes we see that that's been like two years worth of water bills. The legislation now says that if it wasn't passed on, um, that the tenant would not have to pay. Uh, so submeters, a uh, question on what constitutes submeters. We're talking about uh, some of those um, like a townhouse complex, for instance, it doesn't necessarily have an individual water meter for that property like a house might. Um, it's the same as it's been. It's providing evidence that this is how much water that, the, um, that that property has used or this is how it's been calculated. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Sam. Anything else? Uh, I don't think there's too much else from a theme perspective. They're the, yeah. they're the main ones. Yeah, and I think some of the there's a lot of questions about what's going to happen in May around those topics. Yeah, so around those we topics, will so come to those obviously when um, yeah for next year obviously in the lead up to, that. up to um, that. Also, too, what we do know is, I mean, some of the other questions that we've got through about like pet bonds and things like that. So again, our website does have a lot of information that might be able to answer. Um, a lot of that information. Now, a copy of the recording will be available usually within about a week after we are live. So that will be available on our website. So feel free to actually share that with your colleagues um, or anyone else in the rental sector. Remember, we're here to help everyone um, to navigate these changes as well as the current tenancy laws. So please reach out to our, fa our fantastic team in our call centre on our 1300 366 311 number. Or again, look on the RTA's website. We do have a lot of resources and information to help you. We will be having more webinars and events coming up around Queensland. So please do keep an eye on our events page on our website as well. Now, before we log off and close the webinar, a quick survey will pop up once the webinar ends. We would love to hear from you about what other topics you would like to know more about for the future. Um, and this actually helps plan with our education. So please, if you can take a moment to complete that, that would be great. Again, remember the RTA does not write the laws, but our role is here to help you and everyone in the rental sector navigate these changes. Thanks, Sam, for being part of today's webinar. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you to uh, everyone for uh, the questions and for your patience with us.
Thanks, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Um, we hope you, we will see you again soon for one of our upcoming webinars or come and see us at one of our information events across Queensland.